First, live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. Hello, everyone. This is Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thank you for joining us. We are live streaming here out of the Fox 12 Oregon newsroom, and I wanted to take that shot just because it is a beautiful shot of Mount Hood there from our Mount Hood Ski Bowl camera. Obviously, Mount Hood, one of the volcanoes in the Cascade Range. That's not what we're covering today, but it does tie into it. So hello, everyone. Again, Fox 12 Now, a live stream share every weekday out of the Fox 12 Oregon newsroom. We're on our YouTube channel. We're at kptv.com under the Fox 12 Now tab, and of course, we're on the Fox 12 Oregon apps. And what we're going to be talking about in this segment and actually a few future segments is the Axial Seamount. This is an offshore volcano off the coast of Oregon, about 300 miles from Cannon Beach, roughly. We're going to get into that. We'll give you a better definition of what that is. But a recent study shows that this volcano could erupt in 2025 based on some pretty solid evidence from past eruptions and also some really amazing data they're able to collect on this volcano. So again, we're going to have a few different interviews covering this. This one in particular, we're going to be talking to a seismologist from Western Washington University, and she's going to go into detail of giving us a little bit more of an understanding of what exactly the axial seamount is and what this data is that they're collecting and whether we should have any concerns or whether this is something that's going to affect anybody on land when this thing if this thing does erupt in 2025. So we'll get into that on this interview. More will come down the line, but let's jump right into it and talk about the axial seamount. Jackie, thank you very much for having some time to talk to us about this today. And, you know, as a lot of people are, are wanting to know more about this volcano, they're seeing some of those reports that it's, there's a potential this could erupt in 2025. And uh, we'd love to get some, uh, really an educational background on, I guess, to start off, what is the axial seamount? Right. Um, so axial is an undersea volcano. We use the word seamount when it's, you know, obviously a mountain under the sea. Um, it's pretty far offshore of the Cascadia coast. It's about, you know, we're kind of 200 kilometers, miles, I actually can't even remember, um, offshore of the coast. And it's actually a volcano that is sort of geologically, it's really interesting. It's one where we have two tectonic plates that are moving apart, but also there is an additional sort of plume of, of, of material that rises up there in what's called a hot spot. And axial is this interesting situation where it's sort of both of those processes can be volcanic and they're both feeding the axial seamount. So both of those are happening at the same time. And what are the two plates that are moving apart right there? The two plates there are the Pacific plate, which is moving to the west in that area, and what's called the Juan de Fuca plate, which is a relatively small tectonic plate that is moving to the east. And on the other side of the Juan de Fuca is where it dives beneath the North American plate at the what we call the Cascadia subduction zone. And the Cascadia subduction zone, which is not where Axial is, that's not where Axial is. That's where we commonly refer to, you know, for the big one when that does that's happen. Right. That's going to be from that's those right. two plates. So, right. so with this plate being, you know, a, a, a few hundred kilometers off of the coast, mm -hmm. you know, uh, can you kind of pinpoint a little bit as far as from the Oregon coast, where would be the closest point? Yeah, you know, it's kind of, it would be Northern Oregon. I'd kind of have to have to look at it just because it is far enough on shore that it's not substantially different in its distance to a number of places. It's sort of very southernmost Washington and very northernmost Oregon. Um, so, you know, it's, there's no place that it is close to, <laughs> but it would be closer to the northern end of Oregon. Gotcha. Okay, so closer to, to northern Oregon, the northern Oregon coast, if you had to pick a spot. Yeah. Now, when you're looking at this particular kind of volcano, because you mentioned it's the combination of a couple of different things, what does that mean as far as potential eruptions and maybe eruptions that we've seen in the past? Sure. Yeah, so Axial is a... Is a frequent eruptor. You know, it has erupted several times in the past sort of 25 or so years. It erupted in 1998 and erupted again in 2011, again in 2015. So we're actually relatively familiar with what it does when it erupts. And, you know, in general, the thing that drives volcanic eruptions is gas that's contained in lavas. The more gassy and the stickier the lava, the more explosive. And axial is sort of the, the other end. It's not very gassy, and the lava is really runny. So it tends to produce lava flows. It tends to produce 
really spectacular features. We have lots of um, sort of submarine photography showing some really beautiful lava pillars and you know, what we call pillow lavas, which are like round little balls of lava, um, what we call sheet flows that are very long and sort of broad lava flows. But what we don't tend to see is stuff that is um, explosive that we sort of think about when we think about our land-based volcanoes here, like say St. Helens or, or Rainier or any of those. So it's a very oozy volcano. The lava tends to be runny and oozy. And when you have something like that happening off the coast, and since we have seen this before, what kind of an effect does that have, I guess, on the, the region there in the ocean where it's at, and then even beyond that, maybe towards the coast and inland? Right. So, so kind of none, actually. I mean, it has a very significant impact for things like two worms that are living off the, you know, the chemistry, what we call the chemosynthetic life that lives off the hot water and the different kind of chemicals that come out of the ground. Um, but it doesn't really impact our experience of, of the coastline, of the ocean at all. Um, Axial is about a about a mile underwater, but a little, about one, one um, kilometer and a half underwater. And so what that means for us is that nothing really tends to rise through the water column to the surface. So it's not hazardous. It's not hazardous to boats. And because its eruptions are this kind of oozy style, it also doesn't tend to do some of the things that we might worry about for more explosive submarine volcanoes. So for example, we don't think it really could produce anything like a tsunami. There are certainly earthquakes that we record at Axial. We record earthquakes in association with most volcanic eruptions, but they're tiny, 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 tiny little things that we can't feel that don't, you know, cause anything that is alarming to us. So it's sort of a happy volcano in that we can study it without kind of guilt or anxiety. Um, it's just a really cool place for us to understand kind of how the planet works. So when you compare it to maybe some of those, um, I know a little bit south of there, there's been some volcanoes and some earthquakes associated with some of those subduction, that subduction mm -hmm. zone. This isn't one that's most likely, just to clarify what you're saying to understand it, this one is most likely not going to cause an earthquake that's going to be felt. That's correct. That's correct. And in fact, the earthquakes that we, that we do feel, so for example, people know at the very southern end of the Juan de Fuca plate, there was this magnitude 7 that impacted California a few weeks ago. Um, certainly, we know we see these all, all along what's called the Blanco Transfer Fault, which is again another boundary of the Juan de Fuca. Those can sometimes be felt on shore. None of those is associated with volcanic activity. Volcanic earthquakes are almost entirely really, really tiny. They're very, uh, excuse me, volcanic earthquakes, if I didn't say that right. Um, they tell us a lot about the volcano. They tell us about its structure. They tell us about how it behaves, but they don't tend to be hazardous unto themselves and particularly uh, not hazardous when they are offshore or in deep water. That's not something that we're concerned about at all. Uh, when it comes to studying this, you know, you mentioned that we've been studying the axial seamount for, for quite a long time. Um, so given that, you know, wh what kind of things have you learned from that that can maybe be, um, you, I guess, let, let's just talk about that. Like, what are some of the major things that you've learned from this, being able to observe it so easily? Sure. Well, the really, you know, the thing that has made Axial, to some extent, unique among other submarine volcanoes um, is the fact that it is instrumented. So that, what that means is we have seismometers, we have things that are called pressure sensors that are basically telling us when the volcano inflates full of magma and deflates after an eruption. Um, it has things that are constantly reporting the temperatures of its hydrothermal vents. And that's really unique among many of the volcanoes we study because there is this extraordinary set of instruments that are connected to shore by a cable. So what that means is we have real-time data and we can see when it's acting up, we know right away. And we really don't have that for other submarine volcanoes. So it's allowed us to understand how those vol volcanoes behave so we can compare them to volcanoes on land. <laughs> Otherwise, we really don't know what they do without this real-time network. So Axial is the only undersea volcano for which there's been a successful forecast. So Dr. Bill Chadwick of the of, you know, Oregon State has 
you know, sort of consistently provided forecasts on when he thinks the volcano might erupt. And that's why we currently think it might erupt in the next year because of the data that, that we've seen from that. Um, so that's been a really exciting thing to say, can we tell how it's going to behave? Is it similar to what we see on land? Is it different from what we see on land? And that does tell us quite a bit. And, you know, when we're, uh, you know, which is amazing to be able to get that much data, you know, to be able to, to get that and have that accessible to, to learn from that. And, you know, talking about just how that can be transposed and, and, and utilized, you know, for what we learn on land, I guess. Is there any tie in between these two? Like when we see an eruption there in the water for the axial seamount, does that have any kind of indication for something that could happen on the, like the Cascadia range for those volcanoes? Right. So we don't think there's anything Axial can do that can affect other parts of the Cascades. But it does tell us, you know, we learn something from every volcano. We learn that some volcanoes, you know, exhibit a certain type of precursory activity. So maybe, again, they can swell because magma is being fed into them. Maybe they have a particular sequence of earthquakes that's pretty common before they erupt. Maybe they release certain types of gases. And so we try to kind of get the personality of all of our volcanoes to try to understand what they're going to do in the future. And sometimes understanding what volcano A has done gives us a window into whether another volcano that is similar to it might also do. So while we don't think anything axial can do can affect things on shore, it can teach us fundamental things about volcanic behavior that we can apply to other volcanoes. And so it's always good to sort of understand them better so that we can also understand their hazards. Very interesting. Um, well, I guess the, the final question I have here is, um, do you have a time frame this year where you think you can narrow it down to where it's going to erupt? Nope. I think the best thing we can do, you know, so what we do at Axial, or I really should say what, what Bill Chadwick and Scott Mooner have done in the past and what they continue to do looking at, at these data, is they look again to see that it is inflating, that magma is being added to it, and try to forecast at what point will that be just so much magma that it's got to kind of come out. And the rate at which it is inflating like a balloon turns out to be somewhat variable. And so originally we looked at it and thought, oh, this thing's going to erupt in 2024. And then it kind of stalled out and then it kind of started up again and it teases us a little bit. So there is always a certain degree of uncertainty. This is, again, one that we can be sort of have a little fun in trying to forecast because we're not terribly worried about the impact it'll have. So it's a great opportunity to kind of fine tune. Um, we don't know if it will erupt in 2025. Um, it could erupt toward the end of the year. It could erupt in 2026 and it could erupt next Tuesday. So we will have to see. Well, that's uh, that's part of the interesting aspect of it then, and, and part of the fun of learning this and studying this. And really, thank you very much, you know, for joining us too to to just provide some knowledge on this and understanding of how all this works. I really appreciate it, Jackie. It's fun to talk about. Thanks for having me on. All right. So again, I'll, I'll reiterate that. I really appreciate Jackie joining us there for that segment. And we're going to have more, but we learned some things in there. There are more questions that I have, and we hope to get those answered in some future interviews, depending on when you're watching this. If you're watching live. Those interviews haven't happened yet, but if you're watching after the fact, there's a good chance to start the Fox 12 Oregon YouTube channel at kptv.com or the Fox 12 Now tab or on the Fox 12 Oregon apps. So all places to go. If you have questions you'd like answered with this, and I'm sure people do, I'm sure you're, you're watching this and you have your own questions that maybe didn't get answered during that interview because I didn't ask them, well, feel free to send an email, fox12now at kptv.com. Just know that, uh, again, we'll have some follow-up interviews uh, with more experts and the experts behind, the researchers behind that original study that we were talking about. About. So uh, plenty more to find out, and that's what we get to do here with this show, is we can have these longer segments where we can go a little bit more in-depth and, uh, and talk about these here uh, from the Fox 12 Oregon Newsroom for this show. Again, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. I'm Greg Nibbler. This is Fox 12 Now.